and welcome to the 2019 series of Consciousness Central, coming to you from the Science of Consciousness Conference here in this most amazing setting. We are surrounded by beautiful mountains and lakes in this magnificent venue, the Congress Center in Interlaken in Switzerland. I'm your host, Nick Day, and in this series of programs, we'll be looking at a wide variety of topics, some of them for the first time including plant consciousness, the placebo effect, the evolution of consciousness, that historic collaboration between Pauli and Jung, and the latest in psychedelic research. And in this first program, we talk to Mark Soames about the affect aspect of consciousness. And we ask, can feelings be computational? And we also talk to Olaf Spawns, about the connect home. All this and more, and a visit to the posters in this year's series of Consciousness Central. Welcome. So here we are at the first evening of the Science of Consciousness 2019 here in Interlock and we're going to go and talk to a few people, find out who they are and why they're here. What's your name please? Laura Weed. Oh hi Laura, hi. And uh, where are you from? Albany, New York. What's the appeal of the Science of Consciousness to you? Well I just love the topic, I just love this conference, I've been coming many times. Um, I think Stuart and um, David do a wonderful job putting the conference together. Um, I'm giving a paper this time in one of the concurrent sessions. So. Excellent. And, and what is your paper on? Um, it's on um, a theory of consciousness based on fields rather than, um, rather than material composition. So it's an argument for a way to avoid the compositionality problem that David Chalmers talks about. What's your name, sir? Dan Polari, Daniel Polari. And where are you from? Brazil. All the way from Brazil, excellent. Why do you come so far for this event? For me, this is my life, honestly. I work with neuroscience of consciousness perception in other species than humans. So I honestly don't think that we can understand us if we don't reach other levels of what we call consciousness. And how is that it, de it, evolu it developed unto us? I'm a philosopher of neuroscience and cognitive science, so I'm interested in how we conceptualize dreaming and other kind of spontaneous mental thoughts, So, um, and what dreaming can tell us about consciousness. You know what goes on in your brain while you're like decoupled from your environment and having all these totally cool conscious experiences. Yeah. So is there anything this week that you're looking forward to that you know reflects your interest? Like, I mean, the whole conference is really interesting. I have more problem to decide because all these different, because I'm also interested in all this quantum biology and quantum consciousness stuff. Um, and there are like many interesting people here. What's your name, sir? My name's Alan. Alan, and where are you coming from? Tucson, Arizona. Oh, you're coming from Tucson, the hometown. What is it about the science of consciousness that brings you all the way to Interlaken? I'm a psychiatrist. It's something that, that's close to me. The other is um, it's a beautiful area, and it's wonderful to get away and, and enjoy this experience. Okay, and what area of the science of consciousness is most interesting to you? I think being able to integrate um, the uh, an Eastern point of view, uh, uh, the the experience, um, uh, knowing that uh, Western science is, has a only a limited amount of information that that can use to explain things, and it, it, there has to be something deeper to. Uh, the experiential part of things. So I would like to welcome to Consciousness Central, Mark Soames. Um, Mark, perhaps you could just introduce yourself and tell us where you're from and your field. Well, I'm a professor in neuropsychology 
Um, I'm based in the Neuroscience Institute of the University of Cape Town, which is physically located at the unpronounceable Grote Skuur Hospital. Mm. Um, but I, I am also, bizarrely, a, a psychoanalyst. I say bizarrely because neuroscientists don't normally uh, cross that divide. But, but I did so um, because I, when I trained, which was in the early 1980s, uh, in, the interesting thing about the brain and what attracted me to it is that it is sentient, unlike any other bodily organ, it feels like something to be a brain. And yet that aspect of, 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 of neuroscience was almost taboo um, in the early 80s. One was, I was advised by my professors, don't ask questions like that, they're bad for your career. So for all of its faults, I trained also in psychoanalysis because they at least take the lived life of the mind seriously. So I've spent the bulk of my career trying to bring that sort of sentient, real psychology, the lived life of the mind into neuroscience. I think you, in your talk you, you made some distinctions, if I'm getting this um, right, that um, essentially we can model the world using uh, non-sentient means, so we can, we can have cameras that see light, essentially process light and can create an image, we can have microphones that detect sound waves and can recreate sound, and all these things can sort of go on in the dark, so to speak. But the one thing that, as far as we know, and it seems true, we cannot model a feeling. So the affect, the thing that sort of gives us a sense of experience. Could you kind of open that out? And, you know, clearly this is a very, very important part of the study of consciousness, the science of consciousness. Yes. Well, um, so what you've just said about perception, um, namely that it can go on in the dark and that it can be um, executed by very simple instruments like cameras, applies also to just about every cognitive function. Uh, memory, your cell phone has memory. Um, uh, executive functions, in other words, the capacity to decide what to do next. Um, even the solving of really complex problems, computers can do this uh, uh, better than we can. Um, when it comes, for example, to games like chess and Go and so on. So, um, to my mind, the fact that those of us who are interested in consciousness have focused our efforts on these functions um, is, frankly, odd. You know, it's, uh, it's, it seems fairly self-evident that we're looking in the wrong place because these are not intrinsically conscious processes. Um, perception, memory, um, etc., uh, all cognition can go on in the dark. So uh, from, a, from a principled point of view, it seemed to me that the right place to look for an understanding of, of consciousness is some function which is intrinsically conscious, which is inherently necessarily conscious, and that's why I look to feeling. Um, it's not that um, it can't be modeled, by the way, which is what you just said. I'm, I, I don't believe it can't be modeled. I'm just saying that the naturally occurring form of, of consciousness uh, that, is, uh, that seems uh, logically to be the correct starting point for understanding the mechanism is feeling, and that is to say affect. Now, different people mean different things by terms like affect and emotion and so on, which is why I use the word feeling, because that's the aspect of affect I'm talking about. I mean, there is a thing that we have which is called feeling, and uh, it clearly exists as something that you have to feel, otherwise it isn't a feeling. Um, and so it's that aspect, I think, if we can explain why and how feeling comes about, then we are, we, are, we, are, we are asking the right sort of questions in terms of trying to understand how consciousness comes about. Now, I've said that in logical terms, but in, really interestingly, uh, when you look at it empirically, when you look to the brain and ask yourself which parts of this organ um, are the intrinsic consciousness generating parts, it turns out to be the parts that are responsible for affect. Um, that is to say, upper brain stem, um, so-called arousal nuclei, the reticular activating system it's called. It is empirically the case that these structures are essential prerequisites for all conscious states. So much so that if you damage just two cubic millimeters of the parabrachial area of the, of, of the brain stem, uh, in any vertebrate, uh, you will annihilate consciousness. Uh, I say two cubic millimeters in our big brains, uh, but the equivalent structures in any uh, vertebrate will immediately uh, uh, set the creature into a coma. Now, the fact that those structures, reticular activating structures, are responsible for feeling 
uh, for me is a strong confirmation that that is the right place to look. Uh, consciousness is generated by the part of the brain uh, that uh, 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 produces affect, raw feeling states, and uh, these are the intrinsically conscious states also from a logical point of view, so I think it's a very good bet that that's where we should be focusing our efforts. Of course, there is a, um, uh, when we start to sort of just examine the nature, I, you know, we can do this in our own experience, is that for there, there to be a feeling, there tends to be the need for an experiencer, a sort of, there is an, an I, if you like. Yeah. Uh, you, I suppose you can just have a raw feeling, shall we say, just the qualia of the feeling, but certainly in human consciousness, there's a sort of, a, a, an in a sense, an observer, shall we say. That appears to be something that is very hard to explain using standard sort of reductionist. You know, where does that, we, we look in the brain, open it up, and as you say, you can remove a certain volume of it and it goes away, but does that get us anywhere nearer to explaining this, this subjective sentience that, that we have? How can we get there? Well, um, let me come at that from two different directions. First of all, you're correct to say that the sentient being in the simplest sense of the word uh, seems to be generated by those structures. In other words, the simplest uh, conception of what a being in the world might consist in uh, is an affective state, some qualitative, valuative uh, presence, to quote uh, what one of the other speakers, a, a term that one of the other speakers used today. Uh, that does not apply the other way around. You can remove any, any amount of cortex. Um, you can remove visual cortex, auditory cortex, somatosensory cortex, language cortex, etc., etc. Even frontal, this overarching uh, sort of uh, reflective consciousness generating uh, stuff that, that, that most of my colleagues want to call uh, the basis of selfhood. Um, and those patients are still sentiently present. I mean, I see such patients every day. I interact with them, I talk to them, I, I interrogate them about their selfhood. And uh, uh, there are two things that you observe. The one thing is that they most certainly are there on their own declared evidence. You know, yes, uh, doctor, I'm here. <laughs> you know, what's the matter with you? Can't you see that? Um, uh, but the other thing that you notice is that they are affectively overwhelmingly present. In other words, they have difficulty suppressing affective states. They have difficulty regulating affective states. So it's clear that cortex is not generating affective states. Cortex is, if anything, dampening down affective states. So that's one way of looking at it. If you think, what is the minimal neural conditions for a self? You don't need any cortex. There are children born with no cortex who, on all the evidence, are sentient beings, feeling beings. Their emotional responses are entirely what you would predict um, uh, if, if, they, if they did have uh, uh, affective states. They look for all the worlds as if they're affectively present. But you can come at this, the whole thing um, in a, from a different point of view. Um, you could say, uh, what, from a, pu a purely um, a theoretical point of view, you can say, what would theoretically be the minimal conditions for selfhood? Uh, and by selfhood, I don't mean subjectivity in the broad sense, because subjectivity in the broadest sense is just a perspective. You can say you can look at something from the outside, that is its objective aspect. Or you can be that thing. Uh, in other words, you can locate yourself inside of that object, then you are the subject of that thing. But not everything is sentient. You know, computers, cameras, uh, uh, um, cell phones, they're processing information, but there's no evidence whatsoever that they're sentient. So uh, for me, the starting point of uh, what would be the minimal conditions in terms of a purely mechanistic account of, 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 of subjectivity in the sense of presence, in the sense of a being that, is, that, is, that, is, that has something it is like to be there, um, it would be uh, the, the, the minimal starting point would be a self-organizing system by which I mean a system which needs to monitor its own states and act in relation to its own states in order to continue to exist. Uh, that's what I mean by a self-organizing system. Something which is just there is quite different from something which, which needs to monitor. Its, that's the beginnings of what we mean by selfhood, by sentience, uh, subjectivity in the sense of there being something it's like to be that subject, is that you have to have some uh, some sort of need to, to monitor your own states. 
and uh, self-organizing systems have this uh, basic principle. Uh, that's how they continue to exist, is monitoring their states in relation to settling points, in relation to required parameters. Um, and then they act uh, on the world in accordance with that deviations from the, 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 their required states in order to bring themselves back into those required states. Now that turns out to be, number one, the fundamental property of living things. Living things resist entropy. And the principle by which they do that we call homeostasis. So uh, it, it makes a kind of logical, uh, mechanistic sense that, a, that a, an, an entity which has selfhood, which has subjectivity in the psychological sense, that it must, it must have these mechanisms. That doesn't mean everything that has such mechanisms is going to be sent in, but I think those are the minimal conditions. Now, when you look to those upper brainstem nuclei that we spoke of earlier, that's what they do. They are homeostatic, they are the homeostatic, they're the homeostatic and meta-homeostatic mechanisms of organisms. Very simple single-celled organisms already have homeostatic mechanisms. They don't have nervous systems. What nervous systems have is meta-homeostats. In other words, homeostats that orchestrate all the other more lowly uh, uh, homeostats. So it really all converges on the same place. Uh, uh, and and, uh, and I, so you start from the empirical point of view, you start from the logical point of view, start from a mechanistic point of view. It keeps bringing us back to these same things. Mark, thank you so much for talking to us today. That was really interesting. Thanks very Appreciate much. Appreciate it very much. Me thank too. Thank, Thanks thank a lot. So here we are at the posters, the first session of the posters in 2019 TSC. And I am with, what is your name, sir? Prakash Sahani. Hello, Prakash. Hi, so. Sahani is my co-author, but he's not around. These, these are the key questions like, is there consciousness? And is the study of consciousness the key to the study of the universe? And this is what is all, all talk about the hard problem of consciousness, that the standard science and maths, they, don't, they only measure things as the physical quantities and not as humans perceive it. So maybe we need a different way to study these things. And I think information theory and computation are better to provide a working model. What I mean by a working model is something which is useful, like the, the standard model which is for the small particles, it's not useful to des describe a car. Like, so maybe, and uh, we use subjective experience because we don't use objective measurements because how do you measure consciousness? So if you, study the, if you want to study the effect of light, sound, and words of speech, on uh, humans, we see that the different kinds of effects are either it produces a permanent effect or a temporary effect, and either it produces sensory deprivation or it calms you down or it stimulates you. So light, sound and words of speech can be studied like frequencies, like the wave number or the fundamental and overtones or the filters or the sequences, while it can also be perceived as information. We just want to know what is the source of the sound and that is enough information for the human being to know what is producing the sound. So, human perception seems more to be based on the information because we can identify the color, sound and words regardless of the source, like it, you are hearing it at a concert or you are seeing a movie. And we can even imagine this without the stimuli. So, we see that if you see the effect of light, there are certain sources of light which are more likely to produce a sensory deprivation or a permanent effect like the candlelight, or a moonlight near a lake, or you see the rising sun, or you see pure white light, while certain kind of uh, visual sensations like a painting or a movie, they might stimulate you, and they will produce a temporary effect. Similarly, for sound, certain sounds like the sound of flowing water, the ocean, or the wind, or the bees, or the birds, or just monotonic instrumental sounds, they are likely to produce sensory deprivation. So basically what I'm saying is, less information, is more useful to us to understand consciousness and the universe more than the quantum theory and such things. So that's all. Thank you, Prakash. That's great. Could you tell us a little bit about your poster? Yes, sure. Uh, basically, we know a lot about meditation, right? That how it is bringing about changes in our mental state. Here, I have taken nature experience as, let's, let's not say, equal to meditation but similar to uh, meditative effects so what uh, what we've tried to do is we've tried to measure a co we've tried to measure cognitive abilities before nature experience and after nature experience through some cognitive tasks so what we found was that 
there is a lot of difference between how people are responding to a cognitive task before nature experience than after nature experience. As you can see in this picture, that most of my brain area is involved in decision making before a nature experience. But after nature experience, only the part of brain which is involved in, this, in that task is active. What does that mean? That means that I'm saving my cognitive resources because I'm using only resources which are involved in that task. What that also means is that I'm becoming more efficient in doing that task. And what also that means that I'm also resting at that state. So, the nature experiencing is not only clearing my head of distractive thoughts, it's also making me more focused, more directed to the task in hand. So, how I can relate it to meditative med meditation? Meditation also brings in similar effects. It calms our mind, it you know, puts, our, puts our mental state to rest. This is a 15 minutes experience in lab. Just imagine the experience when it is actually in nature. How much efficient uh, we can become just with let's say 15 minutes walk in a natural garden or let's say sitting in a sitting on a bench and watching trees flowers river passing by well this sounds absolutely wonderful so uh, and how how what's the time difference between these two yeah you can see here that the person was making a decision let's say from 390 to 430 milliseconds for the same cognitive task and after nature experience it was about 330 to 380 milliseconds so an efficiency of almost 100 milliseconds on one single task. Wow, and how long were they, they in nature to get this? 15 minutes. 15 Only minutes? 15 minutes, yeah. and that too in lab, not in actual nature. Wow, that's fascinating, that's some great research. Uh, it somehow seems that this is telling us something that we know deeply in ourselves already, yes? Yes, I agree to you, because we have genetically been brought up in nature. So it is our inherent tendency to connect back to our stable state, which is nature. It seems as if we've we've left nature behind and now it's time to go back. Yeah, go back, exactly. Pooja, thank you so much for talking to us this evening. And what's your name, sir? I'm Swami Sharan. Swami? Sharan. Great, okay, excellent. And could you explain something about your poster? Yeah. So this is uh, regarding plants' consciousness. So they are conscious of uh, their own existence or not. So the first of all, they have their responses to the external stimuli, they have the feeling, they have the sort of uh, understanding, and they pass on gen generation to de generation information through their own systems. Though they don't have the brain, they don't have that language, but they express in their own language. It is our weakness that we can't understand their language. We have to develop some system where we can understand their feeling, we can note their feeling, uh, sort of responses, then of course we have done an in-house experiment to show all these things, okay, how they are responding to the situation. I put up uh, six plants, five plants uh, in, in my house uh, courtyard, so those were at the different places, so then I found that their behavior, those are different one, this is independent of any obstruction or near the uh, water level. So it has grown 13 feet, whereas the second one, it has grown of up to only 18, 8 feet. Because of this obstruction, it was going away from this thing. Third one, it is right way, uh, going away at the 45 degree or uh, from the hedge. It is near the hedge. It cannot go straight, whereas they are going growing straight. And the third one, it went out, but I have to support it so that it grows straight with the bamboo. And the, the last one, it was quite near the hedge. It died itself within the six months because it could not uh, survive with it. So I have found that some of the plants are friendly for plants. These are growing along with the hedge because they are sharing water as well as the environment equally. These are going away from the hedge. These are not uh, friendly to the hedge. And this is also another point, Tacoma. So it is also gro growing with a straight hatch. So these are the conclusions. So we need what we find out to consciousness that in view of the plant's consciousness, parameters to assess consciousness needs to be redefined. 
So we need to change their parameters instead of consciousness. If we are judging their consciousness on the parameter of human consciousness, then we are failure. So let us redefine how we can judge the consciousness of the plants, that's all. Did, did you happen to see this morning's talk on plant consciousness? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That must that have so that impressive. must have felt very yeah <laughs> great to see great to see this here. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Swami Sharan, and you're from uh, Dialbark Agra Agra yeah. as well. Of course, of course. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great okay. evening. <laughs>
individual neurons are wired up, it's somehow also reflected in the way larger systems are wired up. There's some, some level of hierarchy to that wiring, uh, which we are seeing definitely. So that, that makes, it makes a lot of sense. I, I wouldn't, you know, there's definitely evolutionary trends, but not everything in evolution is for a purpose, right? A lot of things get, happen because they can't happen any other way. A lot of things uh, ha happen and then they never get undone because this, it, they're forgotten or you can't make the U-turn. Or they could just get carried along or appear out of nowhere because uh, they happen to be, you know, something that you can't do without um, for trivial reasons. So I think we're still figuring out in our field, um, first of all, get better methods to map all this wiring. We're still very much at the beginning. And then better ways of looking at understanding where it's coming from. Um, so one study I'm very excited about right now is, is um, we're looking, we're starting to look at comparative, um, what, what we call comparative connectomics, which is to look at brain, patterns of brain wiring in different animals and different animal species to see, do we see any trends? Um, what is and is not related to the size of the brain? what is and is not related to particular adaptations or behaviors of these animals. And that's never been done before, and I'm, I'm really excited about that project. Wow, that really is so interesting. Yeah. Is what we're looking at a, an information transmission system, a network, rather like a sort of very complex subway system, yeah. something like yeah. this? So you've got signals passing along back and forth in an incredibly complex, speedy, almost unimaginable way. Is, 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 this is that's, what's going that's on. More like, that's more like, we're describing what my perspective is on things really. I mean, the, the analogy with, with, this, with a transportation system, a subway system or an air, air transportation system is, is I think quite useful because we're dealing in the brain also with passing off, well, information in this case, nothing material, but so it's, a, it's a communication network. The brain is a communication network. And I think thinking uh, about it uh, from that perspective is very useful. Our field, my, my field, cognitive neuroscience, has, has I think, been held back uh, a, a lot by this um, mode of thinking starting in the 19th century that you know, one brain region is specialized for one function. Uh, there certainly is functional specialization in the brain. You mentioned V1, visual cortex. It's mostly dealing with aspects of at least early vision and visual stimuli and visual encodings and tuning and so forth. No question. but. Um, but it's also connected. And those responses, even in V1, are modulated by what's happening elsewhere in the brain. So it's all interdependent. Not in the sense that everything is equal, but it is certainly connected. It is certainly operating as a whole. Um, and I think that has been underappreciated in our field. It's coming back now, the last decade or so, with the um, the network paradigm gaining ground and connectivity being something that we can now study. So it's changed a bit in that way, but, um, but really until about you know, 10, 20 years ago, localization was everything. And it's, I think, really been very bad for the, for the development of our, of our particular field in, in neuroscience. Yes, yeah, so I've um, yeah, read about really how um, information is distributed almost globally around the entire, and, and not one region becomes essentially responsible for one thing. It can move around, and even memory, the same, isn't necessarily, you're not necessarily just using the same little cluster of neurons for a memory, it can be elsewhere, which yeah. seems almost yeah. counterintuitive. You sort of imagine it would be localized rather like a hard drive, but yeah. it doesn't seem to work like that. Not quite, and, and, and you know, not, again, not to say that everything is equal in the brain, that every neuron is doing the same thing, or every brain region is participating in everything. That's, not, that's also not true, I think. Um, uh, but it's a, it's a, think of it as a system of systems. There are these, uh, there, there are, you know, you mentioned memory, that's a function that's um, you know, a, number, a number of brain regions, very distributed, are participating in the encoding of, of, of memories and, and the retrieval of memories. And that's, that's not what one neuron or one, one brain region does. There's other parts of the brain that are less engaged with memory, have more to do with prediction or with reward or with, or with higher visual features or what have you. But it's all interconnected. And, and that, that to me is, is, is key. Um, so there is specialization. But it's the kind of specialization that you have in a larger network where what you do and how you participate in the functioning of the network is dependent on how you're connected. This is important. But you're not just doing one thing locally. And that's the, that's the viewpoint that I think um, hopefully we're, we're leaving behind in favor of something which is a bit more, more um, 
network uh, centric. From a sort of physicalist standpoint, the brain appears to be um, very complex sort of neurotransmitters and electrical activity. And if you just take those things in isolation, it's hard to see how we could ever get to our experience of the world, you know, consciousness, if you like. Yeah. And so when you come to a conference like this, the science of consciousness, um, how does that feed into what you're doing? How do you, is there a point at which you start to go, oh, wow, all this comes together to give us this. And, and, and the more we look at this sort of networking idea, this sort of very, very complex, is there a way you can see forward, maybe some sort of explanatory element to this? Well, I, I certainly think that starting from a network-centric perspective and working forward is very promising and ultimately will get us to an understanding of brain function that embraces the fact that brain regions are specialized, but also that they're interconnected. That to me is, is key. Ultimately, it goes down to what I think is one of the driving forces of, of brain organization, and that's the dichotomy or dialectic, if you wish, between segregation, specialization on one side, encapsulation on the other side, integration, which, is, which takes those encapsulated entities and puts them together. Uh, that, that to me is, 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 un underlying, is an underlying principle that I think powers a lot of what goes on uh, in cognition and perhaps even in consciousness. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm an agnostic about consciousness. I have never worked in the area. I have been working with people quite closely who have a strong interest in consciousness, so I've been exposed to it. And I, I, f I also feel very strongly uh, the importance of the topic. Um, I have no particular theory or idea to offer as to how I can link neural activity on one side and patterns of neural activity to, you know, experience in the sense of, you know, that things that I currently experience sitting here with you. This to me is still, there's a, there's a bit of a gap here. Um, so I am quite happy if I can relate neural activity, networks of, of neurons, systems interacting, in a very humble way, just to things like cognitive tasks or operations that we can measure objectively with the tools of you know, cognitive science and, and brain imaging. That is a, a, a more modest um, research program. Um, that's, I think, where, where we can make progress. I, I, um, yeah, I, have no, I have not much to offer on consciousness. I, I, um, I, I do feel I'll give you some, I throw out some layman's opinions. I do believe it is tied up with nervous systems. I don't think uh, a rock is conscious even in any uh, re remote way. So it is nervous systems. Um, I think it's graded. Certainly other species than humans have consciousness and in a graded fashion, perhaps even invertebrates do. And I think it is tied to certain features of connectivity that are a precondition for consciousness to arise. Um, I think ultimately neural information, information in a, in a statistical sense, uh, plays a role here. Uh, I, I, we, even I have worked on, with my good colleagues Julia Tononi uh, and Jared Edelman uh, many years ago on, on ways of um, tying network connectivity patterns to how information can emerge in a multi in a multivariate setting that is as patterns of information and there clearly are patterns of connectivity that that support this and there's others that don't and so and they happen to be patterns of connectivity we actually find in real brains such as modules communities hub regions and their interconnections so i feel like there's something building here, something interesting is coming around the corner where perhaps we're going to get some very interesting, exciting new ideas on the table pretty soon on how information relates to connectivity and through connectivity information perhaps where we can forge a link to maybe even consciousness. And uh, I, hope to, I hope to participate in that by laying some of the groundwork at the lower levels of explanation, if you wish. Um, and hopefully we'll get there one day. Olaf, thank you so much for Thank talking you to me indeed, today. it was fun. It was a pleasure. Thank that was you. very, very interesting. Yes. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Okay. So that just about wraps it for our first program in this year's series of Consciousness Central 2019. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please join us for the rest of the series. Bye for now.